Welcome to Hence the Future podcast. I'm Adam Morcronin, and today we're discussing the future of gaming. That means we'll get into the many ways that the gaming industry is driving technological progress. We'll also assess the myths and misconceptions surrounding video games and get into what we truly know about video games' effects on the brain through research. And lastly, we will paint a picture for what the future will look like once VR, AR, and mixed reality technologies have been fully adopted and have become fully mature. I want to start at the end. Where is video game technology heading towards? What is the end state that we can expect to achieve once we have fully developed this technology? For anyone who's a gamer, it's pretty clear where video game technology is heading. It's heading towards a state where video games are so good that they have become indistinguishable from reality. So all of your sensory data that you experience in the real world would be fully matched in the video game world. And not only that, but video games also allow us to do things that are not possible in the real world. So you can code a game that has different laws of physics, that allows you to summon helicopters from seemingly nowhere, that doesn't have any sort of limitations as it relates to raw materials, no limitations of time, of space, you can teleport. So really the only limitations with video games are our own curiosity and our own will to create and to build new worlds. So where are we now on the path to cyber realism? How far away are we from that end state where video games have become indistinguishable from reality and allow you to do even more than you could do in our own reality? Well, you can think of video games and media and really all sorts of visual content as being part of this long arc of development that started maybe with drawing stick figures on a cave wall or maybe on a piece of paper later on and then eventually that developed into more realistic forms of media, like you had silent movies, where you basically had multiple pictures placed in a row, so the effect was it became like a video, and it started to seem very similar to our own reality, albeit at a very low frame rate. And then eventually we incorporated audio, and we had the talkies, and you could go to the movie and you actually had dialogue between characters, and then beyond that, we had full color TV and full color movies that were a big deal in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And now we have video games where it's not just a passive activity where you consume this visual content. Now you can actually play a role in the visual content that's being experienced on screen. So we had early Atari games in the 80s. We had more advanced games in the 90s and the early 2000s. And now we're at the point where we're starting to approach the uncanny valley, which is the part where our brain actually gets tricked into thinking that we are experiencing reality when in fact we're in a game. So I remember I was at this conference and there was this one VR game where you basically step out onto this platform and you're on this skyscraper that's 100 stories up in the air and then you're asked to step off of the platform. And it really does trick your brain where everyone has this fear of height and once you step off, your brain triggers that fear and it's hard not to get a little bit afraid, even though you know in the back of your head that, hey, this is just a video game, I can't actually get hurt. But we're still not quite there. We, haven't, we have not yet crossed the uncanny valley. And we're getting pretty good. I would say graphics are incredibly good. Frame rates are incredibly good. You know, the Xbox Series X now has a frame rate of 60 frames per second which is really fast and lag times are low. Um, and now you can play epic games with hundreds of people or thousands of people in these huge battle royales. So people from all over the world, in China, in the US, in Singapore, in Africa, wherever, can all be playing the same game simultaneously, which is a pretty incredible feat when you think of it. You're taking all of these various beings and putting them in this one joined reality much like we all happen to find ourselves in this reality that we're living in IRL. But the fact is, most of the time, we know we're playing a game. And VR has not fully caught on yet. We still are, in many ways, in VR 1.0, where you know I was playing this other VR game where you're climbing Mount Everest. And it's pretty cool, and you get this immersive three-dimensional experience where you can see what Mount Everest is actually like. And for that reason, it's amazing and incredible. But there's a lot you're missing. 
you're missing the haptic feedback of what it really feels like to hold a rope or to hold on to your ice axe and climb up the mountain or to feel the wind against your face or to smell the different smells or to hear in a very realistic way to how you might hear if you were actually a top Mount Everest. So a lot of the sensory data that we need to fully simulate the real world has not yet been integrated. So that's the next step. The next step is integrating that sensory information. So we already talked about haptic feedback and other sensory information. Another important element is omnidirectional treadmills. So this is the notion that you're not just sitting on your couch playing video games. And, you know, how realistic is that to actually climbing Mount Everest? But instead, if you had an omnidirectional treadmill, you could essentially just run or walk or jog infinitely in any direction, and that would translate to the video game world. And the other cool thing about that is it adds the physical element that actually gives you good exercise, but also, more importantly, tricks your body into feeling that you truly are in this video game world. And there are omnidirectional treadmills out there already, but they haven't fully cracked the code yet. So we are in for some tremendous technological progress in the gaming world, I would say, in the next 10, 20, 50 years. One of my other favorite trends with gaming right now are meta video games, where you can actually build video games within the video game itself. So Roblox is a great example. They are a super valuable company that's about to IPO. And what makes them so much more valuable than a typical game is it's infinitely scalable. Because when you're in this Roblox gaming world, you can build your own games, you can build your own worlds, you can actually monetize your games and other people can play yours. So it's almost like this explosion of new games that can be scaled infinitely. And it's really similar to sort of the no-code movement where now you can build websites and apps without knowing any code. A system like Roblox allows you to build video games without knowing any code. And that is incredible. You're basically creating all the raw materials you would need to create these immersive worlds. You know, Minecraft is another good example. So I would say whatever system eventually wins out, the one thing that's for sure is that these meta video games where anyone can build their own world is going to be a huge part of the future of gaming. There is also a pretty big stigma that is still around as it relates to video games. Most parents, when they think of video games, they think it's a waste of time. I wish my kid wasn't playing so many video games. It's making him antisocial. He should be out exercising. He should be in nature. He should be with his friends. Why can't he live his childhood the same way that I lived my childhood back in the good old days before there were all these crazy video games? That's the attitude that many parents have. And it's understandable, especially when you compare video games to playing pickup basketball or pickup soccer with a couple of neighborhood kids. Yes, there are very real benefits to playing pickup soccer or basketball as opposed to video games. But to me, that seems like a false comparison because the reality is video games often replace other forms of screen time rather than replacing outdoor activities. So a better comparison would be how are video games compared to TV, like binge watching Netflix, and how are video games compared to social media, like doom scrolling Instagram or Twitter or TikTok. Let's look at a few research studies to see what the actual effects of video games are as opposed to TV and social media. Australia did one study where they found that children who played video games had improved cognitive skills over kids who spent the same amount of time watching TV, which is a purely passive activity, or so, uh, using social media. Another really extensive study studied the behavior of over 3,800 students over a six-year period from 7th grade to 11th grade, and the teenagers basically reported how many hours per week they spent consuming social media, playing video games and watching television. And they found that TV and social media led to increased depression and decreased cognitive behavior, whereas video games did not lead to increased depression and actually improved cognitive behavior. So there are a lot of myths about video games and we should try to bust some of these myths so that we can really set the record straight while also being totally transparent about the pros and the cons. The first myth is that gamers are loners. 
If your kid plays video games all day, they're going to be a loner, an isolated person. They're not going to be popular. They're not going to have friends. This is a misconception that many people have. The data does not support this misconception. In fact, the average gamer is not socially isolated. The average gamer, 70% of gamers, play with other people online or in person. And especially post-COVID lockdown and everyone working remotely, gaming are some of the best ways to stay in touch with your friends and family. You know, I actually play Fortnite pretty regularly with my cousin, uh, Joaquin. And he's like, you know, a nine-year-old kid. And we don't normally hang out in real life together, but in the gaming world, everything is equalized. So even though I'm much older and an independent person and he's a young kid in real life, when we're both playing Fortnite together, we have the same avatars, the same capabilities, and it's kind of an amazing way to hang out with someone. It almost feels like you're hanging out with the essence of their consciousness rather than how they manifest in the physical world. So that's one of the most amazing things about gaming to me is you could be playing with all different types of people from all walks of life on all different parts of the planet, and it is totally equalized within the gaming world. Another myth about video games is that they make gamers violent and aggressive. And there have been many studies that have shown there is a link between violence in video games and violence in the real world. But there have also been many countervailing studies that show there is no real link. So what's going on here? It seems like when you look at the US, the rise of video games is closely correlated with rise in gun violence and other types of violence. But when you look at other parts of the world, there is not a correlative rise. There is a rise in video games all over the world. That has been pretty constant no matter what country you live in. But violence has only really risen in countries like the US, which happens to have really liberal gun laws and other countries that have issues that seem to be unrelated to video games. So it doesn't seem like there is any real data to suggest that violence in video games does translate to violence in the real world. Some people will bring up the El Paso Walmart shooter uh, last year who killed 22 people inside of a Walmart, and he made references during this shooting to video games. So many people blamed the fact that he played video games as leading to his violence. But really, it's clear based on what he said that his real motivation was hatred towards an ethnic group. He felt that, quote, Mexicans were invading Texas. And so he went in there to eliminate this group that he felt was invading his hometown. And that seems to me like much more due to our media landscape, our news landscape, social media. Those are the places where you become indoctrinated with this sense that my group is good, this other group is bad. Video games do not play a role in that. So yes, maybe they, they improved his hand-eye coordination and he felt more prepared to do something like that. But I see many more issues with the media landscape and the news landscape and social media landscape. And if video games went away tomorrow, I do not believe there would be any meaningful drop in violence. One of the most long-standing misconceptions about gaming is that it rots your brain. A more scientific way of saying that is that video gaming reduces the amount of gray matter in your brain. Now this also is a myth. In fact, many studies show that gaming actually increases the gray matter in your brain. And they actually did a study where they analyzed the brains of pro gamers and then they analyzed people who didn't play video games and people who only played video games sometimes. And they found that the pro gamers had even more gray matter in their brains and they were able to make decisions more quickly. They had greater cognitive scores. And it was basically because they had been training their minds hours and hours by playing these immersive games, figuring out how to solve problems in all of these vast virtual worlds. Now, there are some studies that show there has been a reduction in, in gray matter for certain first-person games, and this is interesting. Apparently, if you play video games in a way where you're not actually taking in the environment and you're not actually using visual landmarks to navigate around, but instead you just memorize the course, so maybe you say, oh, I know I need to go left, right, left, and then that's where the enemy is. If you play the game in that way, 
it does reduce your gray matter because you're not making nimble decisions based on visual data. It's more like you're memorizing the way to get through a rat race. And so if you play video games like that, yes, it might not be good for your brain, but most video games are not like that. And in fact, the games that are around in 2020 are usually too complex for you to have that type of approach in the way you play the game. Now let's talk about the pros and cons of gaming now that we've busted some of the major myths. The pros are improved hand-eye coordination. It's known that video games are a great way to train pilots, astronauts, surgeons, and all of these people are essentially training their hand-eye coordination so that when they're in a real life scenario, they already have that muscle memory panned out. And you get that similar benefit just by navigating the real world if you are very well versed in navigating the video game world. Another pro is improved visual contrast sensitivity. This is your ability to see differences in shades of gray, in shadows, in highlights. It's being able to pick someone out ab among a bunch of green leaves where it normally would be hard to see them. In other words, you have greater visual acuity when you're used to playing video games than if you're not used to playing video game. Another pro is you have improved executive functioning, meaning you can solve problems systematically more quickly. And this is an, uh, amazing and definitely rings true because anyone who's beaten Zelda, Breath of the Wild, or any of these games that require all of these different puzzles that are usually pretty tricky, it's no small feat to beat that game. And Next time when you see any sort of problem, whether it's in your career, in your personal life, you already have this problem-solving ability mapped out and trained through your gaming experience. The last benefit that is also a major benefit is that it eases anxiety and depression. Gaming is a great way to let off some steam. So if you've had a tough day, if you maybe don't enjoy everything that's going on in your IRL life, you can go into the gaming world and you can be anyone and you can totally just basically dissolve your ego and just be one with the gaming world and live in the present. And obviously you don't want this to go too far. You don't want to spend all your time in the gaming world that you start to disidentify with your world in the real in real life. But it is pretty important, I would say, especially given what's going on with the pandemic and all the changes that are going on with society, to just step back and be in the gaming world and not have to be so stressed and anxious and depressed all the time. It is a great ex escape for that reason. Now let's talk about some of the cons. The biggest con is that it shortens your attention span. And the reason video games tend to shorten your attention span is because they are so stimulating. So when you're playing a game of Fortnite and you're going all around this map, flying helicopters, building all of these structures with all of these different players interacting, it's such a stimulating experience that when you then go to, let's say, read a book for an hour, it becomes totally boring and it's hard for you to go back to some more mundane tasks when you've been immersed in this multi-sensory video game world. You know, one of my favorite downtimes is not only playing video games, but also listening to an audiobook or a podcast at the same time. And then maybe I'm also checking my phone sometimes, or maybe I have a movie on in the background or some football or something. And it's kind of amazing when you just think about how many things you're doing at once. You're immersed in this video game world, but you're also consuming the stream of content through your audiobook or podcast or whatever you're listening to. And then maybe you're also keeping tabs on the football game and how they're doing. So it is really an enjoyable experience, I think, where you're fully stimulating your mind and everything that you desire to do. But it does make it more difficult to go back to, let's say, reading a book for an hour or going for a walk in nature and not checking your phone. So there is definitely a need for a balance. You don't want to overstimulate yourself. You don't want to become disconnected from what's going on in the physical world. The other major con is that video games are addictive. They are so stimulating and that tends to lead to wanting more. You want to play another game, even if it's past your bedtime and you're a kid or even if you need to do some work and you're an adult, video games are so compelling that you want to keep playing them even longer than you perhaps should. 
And so that can lead to neglecting some of your other duties. Your career may suffer, your relationships may suffer, your performance on a sports team may suffer. So it's just like anything else. You want to take the middle way. You want to not spend all of your time playing video games or all of your time working or all of your time exercising. You want to do a little bit of each. And that's why I think vilifying video games is a mistake, but there is also a grain of truth in it. You don't want to spend all your time playing video games, but I think if you were to replace an hour a day watching TV with an hour a day playing video games, that's probably a net benefit in your life. I would say the same thing with social media. If you normally spend all your time just scrolling Instagram or Twitter, you may actually benefit by replacing that time with video games because it's less passive, it's more active, and it's no, not so much about judging people, which media tends to be a lot about. It's more about experimenting and exploring, which is really the ethos of gaming. Now, I want to compare two of my favorite games to show the qualities of each in comparison. Those games are chess and Fortnite. So chess is one of my all-time favorite games, and what I love about it is its simplicity. There is no fluff. Chess has been around for thousands of years, and during that time, they have really refined what's important about chess and strategy. And that's why it's so applicable to everyday life. You see chess metaphors all the time when you're going through your normal life, where they'll talk about sacrificing pawns in order to win the game, People will talk about the threat being greater than the execution. People will talk about uh, seeing three, four, five steps ahead of your opponent, the power of queens, the importance of keeping your king protected, but also with enough room to maneuver around. So chess is an incredible game because it really has distilled the important elements of strategy and war and battle and conflict in a way that is pure, it's pure essence. There's no fluff, there's nothing extra in chess. But in another sense, chess is a little bit too simplistic. We already have algorithms that can beat any human chess player on the planet. That's been the case pretty much since Garry Kasparov lost to Deep Blue decades ago. So in that sense, chess is pretty simplistic. And why would humans spend so much of their time playing this game that we've already totally mastered with algorithms? Whereas algorithms have not yet mastered a game like Fortnite. They're close. They've mastered Dota, Dota 2, which are more, there's, there's more infinite things you can do, but it's not quite as unconstrained as a game like Fortnite. So in that sense, Fortnite may actually be more complex and thus there's more room for experimentation. You can do near infinite things in the game. So you can try out all of these various strategies like I remember when I started playing Fortnite, initially I would just go way to the edges of the map because no one would be there. And after a while, you know, that would work pretty well, but you wouldn't get good materials. So then I'd go closer to the center. But as you go closer to the center, you realize you really need your teammates in order to withstand all the other people that are near the center of the map. So then it becomes more of a strategy of collaboration. And then you realize, well, you can live a lot longer and escape if you use vehicles. So you start incorporating your use of cars and helicopters. And it really is sort of like the movie The Day After Tomorrow, where you can live the life, the same life over and over again and try all these different strategies to see what's the best strategy to succeed. And you may be able to apply those strategies in the real world as well. So I think it's a little bit of a unfair comparison to say that chess is this great game and everyone should spend their time playing chess and Fortnite is a total waste of time. I think there are important attributes and qualities to each game that make them beneficial to the player. Video games are also a great way to learn about reality. And one of my favorite examples is Zelda Breath of the Wild, which is an incredible game. And it really takes you through the full hero's journey that someone would experience in their own life but you can do it in a game in a week and get all of the experiences that it might take you a lifetime if you're doing that in the real world. So you start off with nothing. You don't have any materials, any weapons, and you have to build it all from scratch. You have to get materials. You can trade that in at shops for money. You can buy new armor and weapons with that money. You learn to master the various elements, earth, wind, fire, and water. 
You have to collaborate with all of these different players in the game. You have to solve all of these puzzles. So you really learn a lot about the world by playing Zelda. And you also learn a lot of the fundamental concepts about our own reality. Like the Sheikah Slate technology is a pretty cool technology and it allows you to transport and do things that we can't even yet do, but which would obviously be very cool if we develop that technology in the future. And, you know, like I said, you go through this hero's journey. So you feel like by the end of it, you've lived a whole lifetime. And that's pretty amazing. So I would say if you're trying to learn how to navigate the world, how to win in life, how to solve problems, how to solve puzzles, how to get ahead, how to outsmart your opponent, Zelda is an incredible game to learn how to do that. Another game that's a great example is Assassin's Creed. And they were the first game, Assassin's Creed Unity, to actually reconstruct all of Paris during the late 18th century French Revolution in 3D cyber realism. So you could literally walk through every street of Paris based on what we know historically, and it is exactly like it would be during 18, the 1790s. And even more impressive, after the Notre Dame Cathedral burnt down in the real world in 2019, they used this 3D rendering of Notre Dame Cathedral in the game Assassin's Creed to help with the reconstruction. So now it's not only navigating some fictional virtual world and going all around, you could literally walk through every street of Paris or any other city that has been recreated in the virtual world. And that is just incredible. I mean, if you told a, a caveman or even someone during the French Revolution that they'd be able to do that, their minds would be completely blown. Now let's explore some of the ways that video gaming is driving the future of technology. And I really feel that gaming is one of these industries that is at the forefront, the bleeding edge of technology. And it's because people love gaming so much. They're so passionate about getting to that next achievement where it looks even more real, where the shadows are even more realistic, the light reflects in such a way where it's even more immersive. So there really is this arms race that's going on with gaming that then translates to many other industries. So one is real-time ray tracing, which allows for immersive changes to light, shadow, and reflections. And this used to only be available in Hollywood with super big budgets, you know, CGI budgets. And now it's readily available for many different applications because it's been so mastered in the video game world. Similarly, there's deep learning that initially started in gaming and now has been applied to many other industries. So this allows for sharper and smarter graphics. Uh, it also allows for some interplay where depending on your behavior, you'll get different results. So I know in Fortnite, for instance, if you always go to the same place, you won't get good items in that place. And the game learns which places you go to the most. So when you explore a new area, you're more likely to get better items. Therefore, the game is subtly encouraging you to explore every corner of the map. So this type of deep learning is just really cool and it really is dynamic and allows the user to have a more engaging experience and really to level up with wherever they happen to be at their skill level and their strategy level in the game. There's also been advances in facial, tech, facial recognition, voice recognition, uh, gesture recognition, and obviously those are now being applied to mobile computing, desktop computing, and other uh, industrial hardware companies. And one thing that Brian McCullough predicts that I think is a pretty good prediction is that video gaming may be the thing to crack open the App Store. So you might have heard recently that there was this battle between Apple and Epic Games where Epic wanted to reduce the fees that they had to pay the App Store. And if you don't know, every App Store, every app on the App Store has to pay Apple 30% of their revenue, which is a lot, especially if you make a lot like Epic Games does. So Epic tried to reduce their fees and actually put that that savings onto the user. So they weren't even going to take more money themselves. But Apple said, you know, that's a big no-no. So right now it does seem like Apple still is maintaining their sort of stranglehold on the App Store. 
and making any company that makes over a million dollars a year will still need to pay that 30% to them. But I think it's quite likely that in the coming years, as gaming becomes more and more important and gamers become more and more frustrated when they're not able to get the games they love on their phone or on their computer or on their console, I think gaming may be the thing to crack open the app store and create a more decentralized type of software application environment. Video games are also playing a big role right now in education and training, especially as many schools go remote and many companies go remote. It's even more important to be able to train people like pilots, surgeons, astronauts, and allow them to perform the same task that they're going to have to perform in a high stress environment and a high stakes environment in the video game environment where it's okay. If you crash the plane, you're fine. If you uh, cut open an artery, you're fine. So this is a really important application of video games. And with education too, it allows students to travel all across time and space. So you can visit historic landmarks, battlefields from the time the Greeks and the Persians had their wars. You can go underwater, you can go to outer space. So it really is an incredible way to learn about the world, especially if you're not able to travel to all of the places you would want to, either for logistical reasons, like you don't have enough money for it, or for health reasons. You know, now we have the pandemic, so it's even more important to be able to go where you want to in your own cyberspace rather than having to travel there in actual space. Now let's get into the future scenarios. Let's talk about the worst case scenario. Worst case scenario. The worst case in my mind is that we get so immersed in the world of games that we start to neglect the real world. This is a theme in the book and movie Ready Player One, where everyone escapes the awful real world that has poverty and pollution and they go into this virtual world called the Oasis. And it's amazing that they're able to escape this virtual world, but it also makes them less willing to fix the problems in the real world. So this is, I think, one of the major dangers of video games where people can escape and they don't have to deal with their problems anymore. And I actually was, was reading Reddit and there's this one subreddit called Longevity where they talk about what would you do if you were able to live for 200, 300, 500 years if eventually we're able to extend longevity indefinitely? And the main responses were all about video games. And people would spend more time playing video games. They'd uh, play different games that maybe they, they wouldn't normally otherwise play. And it made me think that a lot of people get their sense of fulfillment from gaming. They may consider themselves a loser in the real world, but in the video game world, they're a hero. And that's powerful for people who need that sense of fulfillment, that sense of achievement. So I would say that's probably the major risk of video games. And it would also be bad if video games were banned because they are such an important role in what's driving the future of technology. I don't think that's likely, but I'm saying that would be bad. And another bad scenario I could think of is if countries started to cut off the ability for citizens to game with one another, I think that would be bad. So the fact that right now you can play video games with anyone anywhere around the world is sort of a way for us all to come together and realize how similar we are. But if you disallowed people from the US to play video games with people in China, for instance, I think that would lead to a future where there's less understanding, less opportunities for us to collaborate and realize how similar we all are. And the final thing I'll say for the worst case is that we are going to experience a wave of automation in the real world, in the physical world, just like we experienced a wave of globalization over the last several decades. And that may push more people out of work. And if they're out of work, they may lean on video games as their way of getting fulfillment. Now, that may be a great way to earn a living. You can earn a living through gaming, whether you're a Twitch streamer or whether you level up characters and then sell those characters so people don't have to spend all the time uh, you know, growing their character to that level. 
And there are endless ways you could potentially create video games. You could create your own world in Roblox or Minecraft and charge people to play your game. So that's all great. I think that's a great way for people to monetize, but it does disconnect them from our physical reality. And I do worry a little bit about what may happen if you get too disconnected from our physical reality. Now let's talk about the best case scenario. Best case scenario. The best case scenario is that video games help us create the future that we want to create, not only in the cyber world, but also in the real world. And we're already seeing this a little bit with remote work where a task that used to have to be done physically in that location can now be done remotely with a joystick. So one example is people who restock store shelves. Uh, it used to be that you had to go in there, get the crate, you had to move the all the bottles of soda pop or whatever into the shelves. Now, in Japan at least, they have remote robots where you can be in between gaming sessions controlling this robot that restocks the store shelves and so you never have to leave your house, so you don't have to undergo that commute time. You don't have to potentially risk exposure to the virus. So there's a lot of benefits in the crossover between video games and real work. And eventually, as all of that gets automated, there will be many more opportunities to create value in cyberspace. And I used to be much more pessimistic about where jobs and automation were heading. And I felt like everything's going to be automated. It's going to be really hard for almost anyone to make a living in 20 years or 50 years. But now realizing how powerful the creator economy is and the entertainment economy, people are never going to be satisfied with the various ways they can spend their time. You're always going to want to have more connection to someone. You're always going to want to play a more compelling game, a more immersive experience. So I think there is tremendous growth in the sphere of video games that can actually help with a lot of the trends we're experiencing now. And in the far future, my hope is that what is possible in the video game world becomes possible in the real world. So just like how you can spawn a helicopter out of nowhere in the video game world, imagine if through nano 3D printing technology and cloud processing technology, in the real world, you could literally spawn a helicopter out of nowhere. It's constructed de novo by these little nanobots. And then your digital currency uh, bank account is just deducted for that amount. You could literally become like a god in the same way that you're sort of a god in the video game. You can do pretty much whatever you want, build worlds. Imagine if you could do that same sort of thing in the real world. So in that sense, video games are sort of like a testing ground where we can do things in bits, which are often easier than doing things with real atoms and, and physics. And so I think that's, that's just one of the most exciting ways that video games are driving the future. Now let's talk about the most likely scenario. Most likely scenario. For the most likely scenario, I want to first give a few stats so we can get a sense for where we are right now, and then that will lead to where we are heading in the near and mid future. Right now, the video game industry is worth $160 billion. There are more than 2.7 billion gamers around the world, and esports alone will generate more than a billion dollars in revenue this year. Gaming influencers and streamers are becoming more and more popular and more and more important to brands and businesses. And interestingly, music discovery is happening largely through video games, where now DJs and rappers will have live performances in video games, like in the Party Royale world of Fortnite. And so much of music discovery is actually happening through video games and also through TikTok. So when we look at where this is going to head, I think the next major milestone is going to be there will be some either VR, AR, or mixed reality app that goes viral. So, so far, there haven't really been any VR games that are a smashing success. The closest was Half-Life Alex, which came out in 2020, just this year, and it was pretty popular, but still, it wasn't a massive phenomenon. And the biggest AR game so far has been Pokemon Go. A lot of people played that, but 
And every, every iPhone release, they tout how amazing their AR capabilities are. But we haven't yet had that killer game that really unlocks AR, VR, and mixed reality technology. So I would say in the near future, we will eventually have smart glasses, smart contact lenses, and super viral VR, AR, and mixed reality applications that will make the cyber world truly merge with the physical world. And we will have incredible simulations that will not only be indistinguishable from reality, but which will allow you to do even more than you can do in your physical reality. And if you've been listening to this episode and you think, hey, I don't play video games, I still kind of feel like it's a waste of time. Believe me, I understand you. I used to love video games. I played them all the time as a kid growing up in elementary school and high school and middle school. But then I pretty much stopped playing from high school, really until like, you know, from ninth grade until a few years after college, I didn't play any video games. I was totally off the map and I felt like it was just a total waste of time and I enjoyed spending my time doing other things. But in the last few years, I've gotten more into video games and I have rediscovered the benefits of video games and how fun and compelling and engaging and educational they can be. So I would say if you're someone who has a real negative opinion of video games, try playing one of the games on these new systems on the Xbox X or the PlayStation 5 or even the Nintendo Switch. And I think you will be amazed at how good it's gotten, but we aren't even close to where video games are heading. And it is pretty amazing that we're all here along for this ride and we get to experience what will happen in the future of gaming. Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll see you next time. The past, the present, and the future. If you enjoy thinking about the future as much as we do, we invite you to join the HTF community. Simply go to hencethefuture.com, scroll to the bottom of the homepage, and add your email address next to the button that says, Enter the Void. You can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter, at hencethefuture. And, most importantly, we encourage you to please rate and review the show in Apple Podcasts if you haven't done so already. Our team reads and appreciates every single review. Thank you again for listening to today's episode and for staying curious, and we'll see you next week.